I'm kicking this off with Sarah Dessen's That Summer. Honestly, I didn't think much of it. I guess that's kind of the benefit of having read all these out of order. I've seen how she's improved in her writing. There was, came a point where I, I asked myself, what is this book about? What does our main character Haven have to do with any of this book? Like, what is her story? Because it seemed like Haven was just a nucleus that all of the other characters' stories revolved around. And she didn't have a story of her own. And the book is a coming of age for her. And her one big struggle is her height. But Haven had no personality. She doesn't like the fact that her dad has a new wife and essentially has this new life and has become this new person. And she's mooning over Sumner. She hates her job. Everything is revolving around Ashley and she's just forgotten. Her mom may be going to Europe with her best friend and then her mom admits that she might sell the house. Everything is just coming at Haven. All these stories are revolving around Haven, but they don't actually have anything to do with Haven. There was nothing to her. I could tell Desen's progression, how her writing has improved, but I also had to ask myself, how did this book get published? It was just third person narration past and third person close to Haven. It goes to show what the publishing industry was like. It's a simple book and maybe that's what the readers liked, which enabled Dessen to have the prolific career that she has had. But this book was extremely unimpressive. I've maybe only read this book once. This book, Dreamland, and I think maybe someone like you or just listen. I don't remember thinking much of them. They never hit me the same way the rest of her writing has. Now I know why. But anywho, uh, that summer we start off, our main character is Haven. She's 15 and she's like six feet tall, which is the only defining characteristic of her. We are opening with her dad getting married. He is the local newscaster. He's a local celebrity, but he had recently divorced her mother for the local weather girl, Lorna Queen. I'm reading The Truth About Forever, and I knew there was a queen in this universe because one of the other books that I read, there's Queen Holmes. Lorna Queen must be a different entity entirely from the queens in The Truth About Forever which I'm kind of disappointed by because I thought that would have been really fun to tie in Lorna Queen and to see Haven and what's going on with her. Maybe in the immediately uh, succeeding books, I will see Haven in some form or fashion, but as far as I recollect, Haven is never seen again, which is something that Dessen doesn't do. She likes to drop in a character here or there from a previous book, maybe a little mention, something to bring it all together. But Hayden, 15, she's six feet tall. She has a sister named Ashley who is older and is the drama queen of the family. She is small and petite and beautiful and vivacious and everything that Haven is not. She is 19-ish. Uh, she is also engaged to this dude who honestly is a snooze fest considering that Ashley went through boyfriends like most people breathe and she settled, I don't even remember his name, I'm sorry, on this dude who is interesting as milk toast. Then there is Haven's favorite boyfriend who is this dude named Sumner Lee, which we'll get into that, but we're at the wedding. Haven does not care much for Lorna Queen. Her mother does not care much for Lorna Queen. Ashley's ambivalent. She is so true to her father. They are so close that she doesn't say a word against him. Ergo, she says nothing against Lorna. I must have missed this. I must not have been paying very good attention. At some point, Hayden deems Lorna as mean, which we get none of that in this entire novel. It actually seems like Lorna is trying to connect with the girls in Haven at least is pushing her away but we don't really get much of Lorna and Haven's father so like there's just too much going on in this novel and that was the problem since it's so short I think Dessen would have better served to have cut some of these plots 
Anyway, so they're at the wedding. Lorna and Mac get married. And then they go off to their honeymoon. Apparently, he is kind of in his midlife crisis with Lorna. Growing his hair out, getting tans, buying sports cars, all this kind of stuff. Now with the wedding over, it is on to Ashley's wedding. Part of the drama with her, she has this friend named Carol. Carol was a childhood friend who they knew for about a summer, moves away, rarely heard from her again outside of Christmas cards. Yet for some reason, Ashley has got to have Carol in this wedding, but immediately, Carol starts causing issues and she cannot commit to being in this wedding. And my thought is, why not just kick her out? We don't get enough storyline. We don't get enough background to flesh that out, to give me any answers as to why Ashley is sticking to her guns. The only thing we get is at the very end, when she's like a week out from her wedding, Carol has canceled yet again and the mother is like, maybe we just are one bridesmaid short. And she's like, no, I can't do that. Like I can't kick out a groomsman either. We have to have symmetry. Like there, there's no rationale given for why Ashley is so tied to Carol. The one thing that I have been noticing as well, Destin is very, very formulaic. Her main character is generally 15, 16, 17 year old girl, meek, mild, doesn't speak up for themselves, usually really intelligent, withdrawn, doesn't really have much personality. And it's always the result of some sort of outside factor. Something has happened to this person that has made her react this way to life. And then all the cast of characters are loud, colorful, and caricatures which then using a ton of symbolism, Dessen will use to give the main character a come to Jesus moment, get them to break out of their shells, see the world for how it really is and live happily ever after with the love interest. We get most of that here. There is no love interest, which is actually really interesting. The closest we get is Sumner Lee who we hear about a lot. I don't mind his storyline, but towards the end, I, I thought it was a little bit drawn out and I thought he became too much of a caricature and it took an excessive amount of time to learn why Ashley broke up with him when he was the best boyfriend she'd ever had. There's a five year age gap. So maybe Ashley is 20 if Haven is 15. I, I don't know at what point they drift apart. It's probably just the natural progression of life where if Haven is 10, her 15 year old sister does not want her awkward, gawky, whatever, annoying 10 year old sister hanging around. It's made very clear early on the two girls do not get along particularly on Ashley's side. Ashley is really mean to Hayden, doesn't have much time for her. However, when Summoner was in the picture for seven months or so, Ashley was a different person. She was a nicer person. They were all happier because of Summoner. So then when Summoner reappears, he's almost like a love interest for Hayden. Again, he's 20 years old, which in the grand scheme of things, not a big deal, but there is something kind of creepy and icky, almost pedophilia-like with Sumner possibly being Haven's love interest. And it wasn't that he had any interest in her. And it wasn't necessarily that Haven had any interest in him, but we get a lot of moments where she has the warm fuzzies when she's around him. She's happier when she's around him. He has this effect when she's around him. He makes her feel like a better person. She looks forward to seeing him. She spends all this time with him. It's almost like maybe there could be something and it, it gave me the ick. So I was really uncomfortable this entire novel. Thankfully, there nothing happened. He made no moves. Although, talk about the audiobook. It wasn't bad. I, I liked the narrator, but she naturally, obviously from the Midwest. The book takes place in North Carolina. So when she voices the characters, 
She gives them great southern accents, but Haven is from the Midwest. How does that make sense? There was a moment towards the end, the only really, really almost obvious ick moment, where Haven has run out of the house, is having her own midlife crisis, and she encounters Sumner. Sumner has gone to an old folks home and I guess it's a social night for them and so he's there and he's dancing with everybody. They dance. We get another pointed mention of how tall she is and how he only comes up to here but how special he is making her feel at this moment and how everything else doesn't matter and it's all drifted away and then he keeps whispering encouragements to her. I, I fast forwarded. I, I did not want any part of this. Plus the entire old folks home scene completely, completely unnecessary, except that he drives her home. And this is the culmination. This is the climax of the novel where he drives her home and she's like, I don't want to go home. Do not take me home. And he's like, well, it's raining. And then Ashley comes across them and I, it, mm, Anyways, Ashley, she, I thought it was interesting how she seems like a pretty decent person. She recognizes her faults. She's trying to be better when she is acting like a diva. She is being called out for it. And then we have these moments like when she goes to her bachelorette party, comes home completely wasted. She is this really sweet, funny person that Haven wished would come out more, but we get to this moment. So all this Ashley drama, all this stuff about her wedding and the wedding planning, and it's getting closer and closer. We continue to hear about what a doormat the fiance is only for then the bachelor bachelorette nights happen. He goes and does kind of something safe slash boring. She goes off and her friends have this whole thing planned. She gets wasted. They end up going to a strip club. She comes home, like they just drop her off on the front lawn. Again, why they did this, I have no idea. We have no idea who her friends are, what kind of friends they are, but apparently they thought it would be funny just to dump her in her front yard, wasted, with a pair of hot pink men's, probably thong underwear around her neck. Haven, the next morning, she comes down to breakfast. Ashley is not feeling too well. I can't believe I did this. And of course, I think his name is Lewis. Lewis is kind of giving her some grief about acting irresponsibly. Haven mentions this men's underwear, which is a detail that Ashley conveniently left out. Lewis gets ticked. The only amount of personality Haven has ever seen from him. And I get it. Every relationship dynamic is different. Some guys are completely okay with it. I just heard about this thing from TikTok where this person had been in Vegas. She had witnessed a bachelor party. She made this PSA to the fiance, like, hey, look, if your fiance was in Vegas at this point, at this time, doing this thing, then you probably should not be marrying him because he acted like he was not there for his bachelor party. Some dudes are like, I'm gonna do the thing. Some girls are like, I'm gonna have my last two raw. That's just whatever your relationship is like. But apparently this is not Ashley and Lewis's relationship. She doesn't see it as a big deal. He does, he gets pissy, he leaves. She is pissy now at Haven. She was able to talk him down and patch things up before he even got to the driveway or like at the end of the front steps. All this stuff is going on with Haven and her growing pains. And now she is kind of had enough. This is the only time that Haven actually is active. When it comes to a novel, the first half of the novel is usually reactive. And then the second half is active. So they're reacting to whatever caused the novel. And then they come to a point where they say, look, I can no longer just react to you. If I'm going to have my growth, I'm going to have to make it happen on my own. So I'm going to have to take my own actions. The only action she took was at the 90% mark. This is when she is at work. So she works at a shoe store. 
And I, again, I don't know why she works at the shoe store. I guess as a 15 year old, there are not a lot of places that will hire her. And I don't know, maybe this place pays her under the table. There's something about it that she, this is the only option she had for a job. They're having, which I thought was incredibly interesting and sort of absurd. Although I would actually love to do it at my store where there's this one point in the year, maybe twice a year, all the stores get together and basically have a rummage sale where they take all of their clearance items and they put them on tables and, and it sounded like they call them the sidewalks so it sounded like they were outside but i actually think it was inside like maybe in front of their storefronts or something I, I don't know maybe it's in the food court i don't know it doesn't matter but i was like man that would never happen corporate would never say hey let's have a sidewalk sale and further discount all of this just to get it out of here. And I'm like, look, there are some things in my clearance section that are never going to leave. So I would love this. People would gobble it up <laughs> if we discounted so much of what's already discounted. But anyway, so this woman, she comes up. Destin also really likes, and this is, I think, me having grown up, matured as a reader, matured as a writer, matured in my understanding of the practice of writing. So it's not necessarily something bad that most people will notice, but she enjoys creating stereotypes. In this instance, Haven is at this rummage sale. She has a pretty crappy manager who continually forces her to sell or peddle socks. She's manning the table. He's the one who's going back into their stock room to grab sizes and whatnot. I'm like, dude, you, it would be so nice if you had a third employee, but also like walkie talkies would be super helpful. So this woman comes up and she finds a pair of shoes. She is really witchy. I, I don't know. I mean, it's summertime. So, and she's wearing like a bathing suit with shorts and a floppy hat. And maybe she's been at the beach all day and now she's hot and she's tired and now she's here and she's just gonna want things her way and that's what she does she's like why am i paying 20 dollars for a pair of shoes i want this size she goes to get the size there is none because these are the clearance items so they have what they have this woman gets really upset she's incredibly disrespectful to haven she throws the shoe down the shoe comes up pops haven on the forehead and she walks away and haven's like hmm ah uh, you know what i'm in the headspace now that i'm not gonna let that go she follows this woman with the shoe. <laughs> she taps her. And then, you know, my thing is, look, it's kind of like social media, uh, the internet, where people will say horrendous things to other people because nobody can see them. In this situation, it felt kind of like she's on this side of the table. Customers always write mentality, I guess. Entitlement, I guess. I don't really know. But she's like, you know what, I, I can act however I want and if I'm not going to get my way, well then that's not my problem, that's yours. But for me, I'm thinking, this woman doesn't seem to be very tall. She doesn't seem to be very fit. So for me, who's not very tall, to turn around and see someone towering over me, very, I mean, obviously angry, I probably would have taken a step back and be like, maybe my decisions were not the best decisions not this woman she turns around she's like oh it's you she continues to be rude to her and haven's like mm, bam <laughs> she tosses that shoe right at that woman's forehead now the woman is irate i'm gonna call the mall security and you're gonna be in trouble and haven's like mm. this is my one issue with this little scene was that Haven then turns and runs away and I thought it would have been more apropos if she had just turned and stalked off because by running away it's almost like she's apologetic for her behavior which she should be but in this instance what's called for is Haven taking a stand. Haven has had enough and she doesn't care what this woman is gonna do to her she knows she's fired she's essentially quitting so like what does it matter <laughs> so she's had this moment and this this for me it was hard to keep up with this timeline this happens in the morning she goes to a nearby park curls up underneath the slide or something falls asleep and to me wakes up 
mid late afternoon and time to go home for dinner. Apparently that's not. And she did mention that she had to get to this rummage sale at like 5 a.m. So it's, it's perhaps this incident happened at eight or nine. She goes, falls asleep and maybe it's like noon. So she gets home at lunch. It felt like it took place over two days rather than one really long day. She gets home and the manager had, while she was sleeping, called. So her mother, the mother's best friend and Ashley are all sitting around the kitchen table because this is the last straw with Carol. Carol has pulled out one too many times. They're trying to shovel, tr shovel troot, troubleshoot. And Haven, there's a, there's a lull in conversation. So Haven's like, I'm gonna shoot through there only for her mother to snag her and be like, hey, heard from your boss. Haven's like, nothing happened. Everything's fine. She goes upstairs. I don't really remember what she does upstairs, but she does take a shower. She comes out and this is like the day before the wedding. I might be condensing things, but no, I think it's the, so this is, I think like two, couple days before the wedding. I don't know. Ashley's all pissy with her because she's being dramatic and apparently she treated their mother poorly, which I did not get that impression. The day before the wedding, Ashley approaches her again and she's like, you're just trying to ruin my wedding. No mention of the fact that Carol has already been doing this for however many months. All I wanted was for Haven to just say, look, because this wedding is so important to Ashley. And again, Ashley is the center of attention. Ashley's always the center of attention. And Ashley is obviously not capable of seeing that Haven is going through anything, that something is bothering Haven, that maybe she needs to take care of her little sister. She needs to be sympathetic towards her little sister. Cause this sounds like very atypical behavior on Haven's part. Somebody who never speaks up, never defends herself, physically shrinks in on herself because she's so self-conscious of her height. For her to be acting out, obvious cry for help. But Ashley can only see Haven's trying to ruin my wedding. And with Haven's frame of mind, I'd be like, you know what? If this is such a problem for you, like if you are so worried that I'm trying to ruin your wedding, I'm, I'm just not gonna show up. I don't even wanna be in your wedding, so let's have it. She doesn't, but she she does come to blows with Ashley only to be like, you know what? Just shut up, I'm not getting into this with you. And she leaves and of course everybody's like, hey dad. I love this part only because it takes you back, man. She goes to a payphone and calls her best friend, Cassie, Carrie, something. Inconsequential character we did not need. There is always a best friend in one of these novels, whether they're still best friends or were best friends or will become best friends again. This, this girl, she only served to heap more problems onto Haven because she goes to camp, falls in love with this guy named Rick, starts smoking, starts drinking, you know, starts all this toxic behavior. She can only speak of Rick. She seemingly does not care <laughs> one whit about Haven. It's all about her. I know I'm tangenting here, but she keeps saying how she's always calling Rick. He's never home. His mother's always saying, well, he's not there. And I'm like, we, I, we know where this is going. Rick is telling his mother that he's not home because he doesn't want to be with Cassie anymore. And then Cassie meets Sumner and she gets mad at Haven for not telling her how cute Sumner is. And I'm like, why are we getting mad at Haven? Why are we dumping things on Haven? Why are you upset with Haven because Haven is tired of your self-centered? I don't know, it, uh, there's just a lot of caricature-ness in this entire novel. It's, it's just not a good book. She calls Cassie, Cassie's like, where are you, are you okay? And of course I'm thinking, oh great. Now Cassie just wants Haven to come over because it's a sting operation so that her mom can spring out of the bushes and take her home because the mother has called Cassie's home and Cassie, who is the eternal 
eavesdropper listened to every word that was said. Sounds like she kind of sides with the mother. I don't, there's nothing that indicates that she cares about Haven or Haven's well-being at all. Haven's like, mm, actually, no, mm -mm, I, I am not not coming to your house and I'm, I'm fine which i'm like thank you haven and this is then when she runs into sumner and she goes to the old folks home and there is another moment in this novel there's another character named gwendolyn rogers and i just finished just listen so you know this strikes a chord because the main character in just listen is a model for the lake view models and the entire book first, I was like, is this girl a good model? I, I can't tell. She's an ambivalent model at best. But are the Lakeview models any good? Because it sounds like a real small town thing where there's not a lot of qualifications required to model for them. I, I don't know. There's not much information given. But Gwendolyn Rogers was a Lakeview model. She's one of the only people who is taller than Hayden. But she left, she went to New York, and she became a supermodel. Mm, rumor has it that she was engaged to a photographer and then found him in bed with somebody else, had a nervous breakdown, came back to Lakeview, and is a walking zombie. Doesn't wash her hair, doesn't take care of herself, just like goes around in a, a, a waking coma why Gwendolyn Rogers was important I don't know there is a moment at the end where Haven runs into her and she has an epiphany because of Gwendolyn Rogers we missed so much there was so much potential with Gwendolyn Rogers that we completely missed because there was not time I would have cut Gwendolyn depending on what else we would have cut I would have cut Cassie um, I think the big stories here, I would have cut mostly the, the, the dad and Lorna Queen. I think Ashley's wedding and her relationship with Ashley were the important storylines here. I think we could have had an underlying storyline with her dad who turns out he and Lorna are, are pregnant. And I, I honestly, I think it's been a couple of months since they got married. And so obviously they got pregnant before they got married, but now they're going on another vacation. A lot, a lot happened in a very short span of time. We, we needed to pare it down, but it could have been a good subplot because this is a coming of age story for Haven, but it took up a lot of bandwidth. I was so tired of hearing about how much more hair he had since the last time that Haven saw him. Is it growing down? Is it growing out? Does he have hair plugs? Why does he have so much hair? Is it in his armpits? Is it on his chest? Where is this hair? I, I would have demoted their storyline and I would have actually tried to have a resolution with her and her father. And there is none. She spends one night a week with him alone at which point he says, you know what? Lorna really wants to get to know you girls, which leads to, well, instead of us having this father-daughter time, eventually it's going to also include Lorna, which is not a problem if we had more time to explore it. But Haven has these issues with her dad. And then there's a point where I guess he was coming to pick her up for something, but she wanted him to come get her walk up the front steps, ring that doorbell, and come get her. Instead, he sits in his car and he honks his horn until she doesn't come out and he decides, I'm gonna leave. And that's essentially the last we saw of him until he walks Ashley down the aisle. So yeah, relegated that to a, a minor subplot and just re-emphasized her relationship with her sister, how the sister's relationship and engagement and marriage affects Haven. Also, yeah, all of these insecurities she has. I don't mind knowing she's tall, but if that's her own divining characteristic, then I don't care. We get to that part at the old folks home. Ashley comes across Haven and Haven says, why did you break up with Sumner? Because she heard it. It was Halloween, Ashley, Sumner, and then one of Ashley's friends went to a party that everything seemed great 
until they came home and Ashley was breaking up with Sumner. No explanation whatsoever. Ashley's like, well, he cheated on me. He cheated on me with my friend. And that was it. So, yeah. And I'm like, are, are we going to dive into this? How long had they, they been cheating? Did they just have an encounter at this party? What's going on here? Yeah, I, I, we will never know. But uh, this is enough for Haven and Ashley to patch things up. The wedding to go on without a hitch. Haven, it's almost like where the narrator sums everything up and, and then we kind of continue to move forward. But really it's just Haven sitting there thinking about the future while also detailing what the future will be because the future has happened. It seems that she overcomes her issue with her height. She and Ashley are on a better terms. She's at peace with the fact that her mom is gonna go off to Europe and sell the house and everything will be fine. Even her dad with all of his hair and that newborn baby with Lorna's freakishly small ears. If you could tell me what the point of this novel was, I will give you a gold star. Yeah, needless to say, not my favorite. There we go. Mm, going to bed. And I'll see you tomorrow.